In this series on mechanics, we've progressively established a method to understand a world in motion. This paradigm assumes the existence of three fundamental dimensions, that of space, time, and matter, or mass. L, T, and M. Why just these three? It is not yet time to answer this question. At this point, we can only concede the historical predominance of this trinity. We've seen that the relationships between these three dimensions can be mediated by what we call mechanical quantities, or mass-carrying quantities, with a particular dimensional structure. When the space and time exponents, x and y, are small integers, we get the usual suspects of mechanics, neatly arranged in the table. This table is what we started with in episode 1, and we are still discovering its potential to understand kinematics as dynamics, that is to understand motion as arising from the interplay of mechanical factors. We've played for a while with pairs of mechanical quantities, which produce power laws in the kinematic plane. These scalings can be seen from a bunch of different perspectives, depending on the types of variables kappa 1 and kappa 2. We used a lot what we call the canonical perspective, where the horizontal variable is a time or duration, and where the vertical variable is a distance or size. Two variables that conveniently align with the fundamental dimensions. In theory, this line or power law extends to arbitrarily large or small scales. In practice, measurements are always restricted to a finite interval. Since episode 9, we know that we can understand this by going from two mechanical quantities to three. When dynamics are governed by a trio of mechanical quantities that form a triangle in the mechanical plane, or table, we can understand turning points in the dynamics. Each pair of the trio is associated with a line or regime, so we do not just get two intersecting lines, but three. As we said in the last episode, we get three for the price of two. And the intersection of the three line is what we called an event, a proper event. Three mechanical quantities that are not aligned give three regimes intersecting at the same location in space and time. In space time. But as we saw in the last episode, there are a lot of cases out there where only two mechanical quantities have been identified, resulting in an incomplete or pseudo-event. These pseudo-events are begging to be fully mechanized. We've done this on a couple of examples related to droplets in the last episode, and we've seen how a complete mechanical picture always offers new opportunities to connect the dots between apparently disparate phenomena. We saw then that the seemingly odd diffusive scaling of some low viscosity drops could be well understood by recognizing the influence of a force. The same force that allowed us to capture the viscous dynamics of coalescence of drops and bubbles in viscous outer fluids. Because these two cases may seem anecdotal to some viewers unfamiliar with the world of capillary flows, Today we'll address an example that will speak to all. It is time to come back to the most famous intersection in science. The bridge between Kepler's law of orbital motion and Galileo's law of free fall, a stage we set in episode 6. We saw then how Newton approached this intersection by mechanizing Kepler and by connecting the scale of the crossover to the size of the Earth. With Newton's insight, is this intersection understood solely from mechanical parameters? No, it isn't. And such unfinished business deserves our close attention. The dissection of this intersection between terrestrial and extraterrestrial kinds of motion is what gave birth to modern science, so we must tread lightly. How could we follow in Newton's footsteps anyway, when he himself admitted to be standing on the shoulders of giants? Rather than overplaying gravitas, we'll approach this situation with levity. We'll look at this intersection as a great exercise for the methods that we've been promoting in this series. As a challenge or puzzle for us, for you, to play with. So, this is what we inherited from Newton. Before we dive in, let's homogenize the notations. First, we've got two kinds of length and times here lower and uppercase d's and t's, respectively for terrestrial and extraterrestrial power laws. Nowhere else did we take such precautions, so let's just use lowercase everywhere, keeping in mind that the nature of space and time may vary from one power law to another, continuous or periodic. Second, 
Kepler's law is here written in terms of the gravitational constant, g. But as we've seen before, this quantity does not have standard dimensions. So recalling episode 6, we may instead use its inverse, the levity, and the lower case m for the mass of the Earth. So Kepler's regime is mechanically complete, simply given by a pair of mechanical quantities. Third, thanks to Newton, we know the space coordinate of the intersection is not exactly the radius of the Earth. There are so-called numerical prefactors of order 1. The following will forget about these subtleties, use L, and call it the size of the Earth, roughly the size of the Earth. So we have one mechanical regime, one kinematic regime, and one length without any apparent mechanical underpinning. Sorry, Mr. Newton, but this intersection is merely a pseudo-event. It is not a proper event, because the mechanical understanding of the crossover between terrestrial and extraterrestrial motions is incomplete. In light of the previous episode, Newton's treatment of Galileo's regime is clearly hazardous. Newton expressed the gravitational acceleration g from Kepler's mechanical factors by going through the intersection, a classic example of anachronism, using the long time and large scale to express the short time and small scale. Little g is given from big G, and the mass and the size of the Earth, or with the levity if we prefer. Anyway, the resulting scaling mixes kinematic and mechanical parameters, more precisely geometric, L, and mechanical for the mass and levity. So this scaling is incomplete, a self-similar solution of the second kind in Barenblatt's words, or one and a half kind if we're picky. A scaling like this is not a direct consequence of dimensional analysis, and we know this kind of formulation can be very misleading. We cannot interpret the mass of the Earth as the impelling factor, nor the levity as the impeding one, because the geometric parameter L scrambles everything. The only thing we are saying here is that Galileo's regime is the quadratic power law going through the intersection. The time tau of the intersection is easily obtained from Kepler's regime at the intersection. Once we have this time scale, it is easy to see that the formula derived by Newton for the gravitational acceleration is just the acceleration that corresponds to the coordinates of the pseudo-event. With this approach to freefall, we haven't uncovered much about the mechanics behind Galileo's observations. To reach a deeper understanding, we must find a way to express the freefall from a pair of mechanical quantities. But which ones? Can we use one of the quantities from Kepler's regime? Evidently not both. Should we turn the size of the Earth into a proper regime too? After 10 episodes of learning how to deal with this table, these are the kinds of questions that we can ask. To narrow our search, we'll first assume that Newton's formulation of Kepler's law should be left untouched. In our notations, this means that we start with two mechanical quantities, the mass of the Earth m and the levity, which is basically the inverse of the universal constant of gravity. So we have two mechanical quantities, and we are seeking a third one to close the deal, to get a proper event. Let's start with a simple model, where the third mechanical quantity is a mass per unit area, lambda, a 2D mass density. This model has a fairly straightforward geometric interpretation, maybe too simple, probably the reason why it falls flat. We could not find any mention of this model in the literature, but please let us know in the comments if you've seen something like this before. So we have three mechanical quantities. Pairing levity and mass gives us Kepler's two-third regime. The mass and 2D density are on the same line, so they will give us a simple length. And the levity and 2D density are one column and two lines apart, so they will give us a quadratic regime. One trio, three pairs, pretty standard stuff. Three pairs, and so three regimes. The next thing to do is to identify each equation to each line on the plot. We know Kepler's. Then the horizontal line is a simple length, so it must be coming from pairing mass and 2D density. And the third pair is Galileo's regime. We've turned a pseudo-event into a proper event. What have we learned? 
We've learned that freefall can be understood in close analogy to orbital motions. Both kinds of motion share the same impeding factor, levity. They differ only in their impaling factor. For celestial bodies far enough from the central mass, the motor of motion is the total mass. In contrast, for bodies smaller than the central mass, the motor becomes the mass distributed over its area. In this model, the switch from a two-third parallel to a quadratic parallel is understood as a geometric effect. Both kinds of motion are gravitational, in the sense that they use the gravitational constant, or levity, but the degree of proximity to the attracting body alters the way in which the mass is felt, either as a point when sufficiently far away, or as distributed on a surface when close by. In this model, the crossover size is understood as a balance between the mass and 2D density. The greater the mass, the greater the size of the Earth, but the greater the 2D density, the smaller the Earth. This approach is valid, but it feels somewhat unsatisfactory. Why? Because for historical reasons beyond our point, explaining a size as a ratio between a mass and a density is not really favored. One rather defines the density from the mass and size, area, or volume, depending on the type of density. For instance here, since the mass of the Earth is around 6 10 to the 24 kilograms, and the surface of the Earth is around 5 10 to the 14 meter square, then the 2D density is around 10 to the 10 kilogram per meter square. Saying that the value of the density is due to the ratio of mass and area is fine, but turning the formula the other way around to define the size from the density and mass leaves a bitter taste. Maybe we shouldn't try to express the size of the Earth as a simple length after all. Let's try to answer the following question. If we keep Kepler's regime as due to mass and levity, what kind of third quantity can we choose so that we get a quadratic regime? If we only restrict ourselves to three mechanical quantities, there are two possible scenarios. Either the quadratic regime depends on the mass of the Earth and an unknown quantity, or it depends on the levity and an unknown quantity. It cannot depend on both, since this would lead to Kepler's regime. In one scenario or the other, what are the possible choices of a third quantity? Little by little, we are forced to consider the asymmetry between mechanics and kinematics a bit more closely. If we know the mechanical parameters, then we know how to derive the unit parallel associated with it. We've been doing that for a while now. Conversely, if we just know the kinematics, then there are multiple mechanical models to choose from. The right combination of mechanical quantities is the one that allows the greatest number of observations to be synthesized. Finding the right combination is a fun game of mechanical bingo. We've played that game a few times already in the last episode. Let's recall how it works. Here we start with two mechanical quantities. We need to find a third one, which would give Galileo's regime, when combined with either the mass or levity. Let's first consider that Galileo's regime depends on levity, not directly on the mass of the Earth. In this case, the third quantity must be on a diagonal of slope minus 2, going through levity. If we want to restrict ourselves to standard mechanical quantities named on this table, then there are only two choices. If we use the 2D density lambda, we get the geometric model we talked about already. Then the size of the Earth is a simple length. The other possibility is to consider a stress or pressure sigma. Let's see how we can interpret this one. Three mechanical quantities, three regimes. The first is Kepler's law. The third is Galileo's freefall. The one in the middle is a regime we got for free, and which remains to be understood. So if for the third quantity we choose a stress, with the right value, then combined with the levity we get the freefall. And adding the mass, we get a third regime for free. That is not a simple length anymore, but it is intersecting the first two at the terrestrial to extraterrestrial crossover. We see three questions to be answered. First, what is the value of the stress and how to interpret it? Second, how can we understand the freefall from it? Third, what is this third shrinking regime, where the size decreases as a parallel of time?
First thing first. With this trio of mechanical quantities, the size associated with the event is still the size of the Earth, but now it is given as a combination of the three mechanical quantities. How to interpret this formula? One way to do this is to seek a connection to the hydrostatic equilibrium, the first kind of simple length we discussed in episode 2. This formula is often used to understand the size of astronomical bodies as a balance between an internal pressure, stress or elastic modulus, sigma, and a force density, psi. This force density is a weight density, a substitution we've seen a lot. But wait, the density rho also depends on the mass m and size l, and using Newton's formula for the gravitational acceleration, we see more size and mass dependent, and g, or its inverse, the levity. Putting everything together, we see that these two formulas are actually connected. So the stress sigma is the elastic modulus of the Earth, resisting its compression under gravity. It is around a few hundred gigapascals. Now that we have an understanding of the stress sigma, we can try to interpret the two regimes depending on it. First, the freefall. If we compare this regime with the orbital regime of Kepler, we see that they share the same impeding factor, levity. But whereas the extraterrestrial orbital dynamics are driven by the mass of the central object, the terrestrial freefalls are driven by its elastic modulus. That's an original take on gravity. The weight of an object on a celestial body basically depends on the inner pressure of that body. Please double-check yourself that this formulation is indeed correct. But even if these formulas are correct, are they enlightening us in any way, or are they just confusing us? The final twist is the third regime. Here it is given from the canonical perspective, a variable size d versus a variable time t. A change in perspective can help us understand this scaling a bit more easily. We can multiply both sides by d square, then the variables on the right can be grouped together and understood as the square of a variable speed v. Rearranging, we may get an idea. To try something we've only done once at the end of the explosion series, to define mechanical variables. For instance, here, this ratio is the inverse of a density, a variable density. We'll discuss how to generally define mechanical variables before the end of this series, so this example is just a preview. The variable density rho, here, is the density of an object of mass m equal to that of the Earth, but with a variable size d. So in this context, the variable speed v can be understood as the speed of sound in a body with an elastic modulus equal to that of the Earth, but with a variable density rho, given by the mass of the Earth and a variable size d. Back to the canonical representation. The third regime represents the evolution of an object of size d, of constant modulus or pressure sigma, but shrinking at the speed of sound, which decreases as the density of the object increases. Is this useful in any way? If you're interested in planetary formation, you might think so. Overall, this mechanical model of the transition between freefall and orbital motion elevates the elastic modulus of the central body to a key player giving a rather unusual interpretation of Galileo's regime and a mysterious shrinking regime for free. Is such a shift in outlook worth it? Let us know what you think in the comments. Because although this model is exciting, as we said earlier, it's not the only possibility. With this model and with the geometric model from before, we consider cases where the freefall depended on levity. So the third quantity was on a line of slope minus 2 going through levity. Instead, the freefall may depend on the mass of the Earth, in which case the third quantity must be on a line of slope minus 2, but now going through the mass. If we restrict ourselves to the standard quantities that are named on this table, the only candidate is the force. Well, then, three mechanical quantities, three regimes. So we get a different mechanical model of the event. How to interpret this model? We'll leave it to you as an exercise to identify the nature of the force F by deriving how it relates to the size of the Earth, and then to find interpretations for the freefall and for the additional linear regime depending on levity and force.
let us know what you find in the comments. So far, we've approached mechanical models of this crossover by assuming that Newton's formulation of Kepler's law was untouchable. Orbital dynamics depend on the central mass and gravitational constant, or as we put it, on pairing levity and mass. And that's it. Well, no offense to Newton, but we feel adventurous today, and we want to try something else, what we may call the capillary analogy. As we'll see now, planets can be understood as droplets, and gravity as a sort of capillary force, running up objects that it affects. We're going against Sir Isaac Newton here, so we must proceed with caution. He won't mind, but his many disciples may take offense. The best would be to have an authoritative figure on our side, like the Nobel laureate Chandrasekhar. For a while we've been under the impression that what we are about to present was basically Chandrasekhar's idea. We feel we've read about this somewhere, but couldn't find a reference in making this video. So if you know any connection between his work and this capillary analogy of gravity, please let us know in the comments. Alright, the observations we want to understand are the following. We have two parallels, the quadratic parallel from Galileo for free falls, and the two-third parallel from Kepler for orbital motion. Two-third, we've seen this exponent in another context, when discussing pinching, coalescing and spreading droplets, or capillary ripples at the surface of liquids like water. Like Kepler's law, these regimes display a size proportional to a time, the power two-third. For droplets and ripples, the exponent was understood by pairing a surface tension gamma with a density rho. Indeed, these two mechanical quantities are separated by three columns and two lines. And mass and levity have the same relative placement, three columns and two lines. Crazy idea. Can we try to understand Kepler's regime from a struggle between surface tension and density? We know that we'll get the same exponent, and maybe it will be easier to find a third quantity with this pair than with the one chosen by Newton. If the only thing we have is a single regime, any pair of mechanical quantities with the same relative placement is equally valid. In particular, here, surface tension and density is as good as mass and levity. Both pairs give rise to the same scaling between space and time, but with different expressions for the mechanical factors. If we want the two laws to be exactly equal, we must define a surface tension and density that will match the values of levity and mass. And since the levity is a universal constant, we just need to match the surface tension and density to the mass of the central body here at the Earth. To better understand this translation formula between two mechanical models of Kepler's law, we can assume that the density rho is that of the central object, so neglecting numerical factors, it is around m divided by l cubed. So rearranging, the surface tension gamma can be understood as the gravitational potential energy per unit area on the surface of the Earth, here written using the gravitational constant g to facilitate comparison with textbook notations. We invite you to do the couple of lines of algebra yourself to convince you of the validity of this equation. Written in this way, this effective surface tension is not so frightening anymore and we're ready to concede that Kepler's regime can be understood from pairing this surface tension with the density of the central object. It is an unconventional view of gravity, but it's not wrong. And now that we've made this first step, the next one is comparatively easy. Since we can conceivably define a surface tension from gravity, maybe we can understand the size of astronomical bodies like the Earth in analogy to the way we understand the size of droplets. This wonderful picture by Marcus Riggles is the perfect segue. Expertly crafted, it shows a pinching droplet reflecting a map of the world in the background. Droplets cannot have all possible sizes. In the presence of gravity, their size is limited by the capillary length, an example of simple length we've introduced in episode 2 and which we've seen on a few occasions since. Can the size of the Earth be understood from such a balance? Why not? Since we now have an expression of the surface tension from the gravitational potential energy, this equation is just a way to define the appropriate force density psi 
plugging in the expression of the surface tension, we get a force density depending on the mass and size of the central object. A formula that we can split to reveal the central density and the acceleration of gravity g, written a la Newton. So the force density is the good old weight density. If we recap, we have three mechanical quantities in this model. The density, weight density, and surface tension of the central object. We know this particular trio, it's one of the examples we've covered in episode 9, when discussing ripples and waves. We have three regimes. The first is Kepler, the second is Galileo, and the third is the size of the central body, understood as a capillary length. We have a fully mechanical model of the intersection between terrestrial and extraterrestrial gravitation. Admittedly, a strange and unorthodox model, but a valid model anyway. This capillary analogy allows us to make unexpected connections between apparently different dynamics. On this plot, we have the transition between free falls and orbital motions, around and on Earth. In this case, the density is around 5500 kg per cubic meter. The force density is 5.4 10 to the 4 kg meter minus 2 second minus 2. And the effective surface tension is around 2 10 to the 18 kg per second square. If we select a different astronomical body, like Jupiter, the curves are shifted according to the new values of density, force density, and surface tension for Jupiter. The data points on Kepler's regime correspond to the Galilean moons of Jupiter, and the freefall trend correspond to the acceleration of gravity on Jupiter. If we now consider the Sun, we have to increase a bit our scale to accommodate the orbiting planets. Earth, Jupiter, Sun, these three cases correspond to the trio of surface tension, force density, and density in the context of gravity. The exact position of the curves depend on the values of these three mechanical parameters. The exciting advantage of this capillary analogy of gravity is that we can now interpret the dynamics of droplets, ripples, and waves with the same framework. Let's see this with waves and ripples. In episode 9, we discussed their dispersion relation, here measured in the case of water. Three lines intersect at a single point. The underlying trio is the same, although the values of the mechanical parameters are different. In particular, the value of the surface tension is much smaller than in the astronomical arena. To see more clearly the analogy with the crossover between Kepler and Galileo, we can represent the same data, but from the canonical perspective. Here, the size d is the wavelength of the ripples and waves, and the time t is their period. The long wavelength regime is analogous to Galileo's freefall regime, depending on the force density and the density. The short wavelength regime is analogous to Kepler's two-third regime. And the horizontal regime is the capillary length, here a bit large due to numerical factors like 2 pi. If we read the plot from left to right, in this context, the data start on the two-third regime and end on the quadratic regime. The opposite scenario is observed in the gravitational arena. Here, the data are first on the quadratic regime, then on the two-third regime. Why such a difference? We've been using arbitrary units so far, seconds, meters. It's time to use the objective units given by the coordinates of the event, as derived in episode 9. For each set of curves, for each event, we can calculate the values of these units and rescale the curves accordingly. Here is the set corresponding to the Earth, with the freefall and two satellites, the International Space Station and the Moon. Of course, with these objective units, the Galilean Moon neatly align. And if we consider the solar system as a whole, the orbital characteristics of the planets also fall on the same master curve. And now, thanks to our capillary analogy, we can also place the dynamics of waves and ripples. We could of course add more data, like the moons of other planets, or the pinching, coalescence, and spreading of low viscosity fluids. But even with the data on this plot, we see a major difference between standard capillary dynamics of liquids and gravitational dynamics as understood by Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. We are dealing with the same event, understood from the interplay of surface tension, force density, and mass density, 
but the paths are different. Why? More generally, if we have an arbitrary event, we know the regimes cross at a single point. But how can we know which path will be taken? Will there even be forking path? This intriguing example is suggesting a way to approach these questions. Here, when we compare gravitational dynamics to capillary dynamics, we find two distinct sets, two paths, two ways to approach the same event. As we will see in the next episodes, we can understand the difference between these two classes of motion by introducing a fourth mechanical quantity. Considering a third quantity helped us find objective units, much more legitimate than any subjective choice, metric, imperial, or otherwise. The fourth quantity will allow us to challenge an even more pervasive bias, the one introduced by our numbering system. From the beginning of this series, we've been subserviently using logarithmic plots in base 10, but why 10? Because of the number of our fingers. And that is terribly anthropocentric and absurdly unwise. Overthrowing this archaic tradition is inevitable if we seek a deeper understanding of the relationships between space, time, and matter. And lucky for us, it comes about naturally once we consider four mechanical quantities.